I have made a mistake. We have made a mistake. I already filmed this video and accidentally erased all the footage. You're probably wondering, Trin, how does that happen to one? Well, when I was filming the video, my memory card ran out of space, so I just started to delete a bunch of footage so I could free up some space for it. Little did I know, I was actually deleting the footage that I was currently filming, and now I only have 30 minutes left of that video. So it is the next day, and I am refilming the entire thing. I really wanted this to be a first time watch for you guys. I thought all that footage was so funny. I am so disappointed that it is not a first time watch, but I'm going to try to give you my best performance of this commentary right now. Uh, I'm not going to be faking my reactions uh, or pretending that it's the first time I've seen it, but I will be trying to give you guys a funny commentary to still enjoy. Make sure you guys subscribe to my Patreon where I hopefully don't delete all the footage that I record for the Patreon. There's already a Patreon exclusive video up right now, which is my full commentary to the movie musical Burlesque. It was really fun to film and I thought it was really funny. So if you guys want to go watch that. It's on my Patreon right now. It's only $5 a month for two Patreon exclusive videos every single month and all access to my main channel videos, early access and ad free with some extended cuts. Today we're going to be watching Beautiful Disaster. If you guys don't know what Beautiful Disaster is, it is a book adaptation film based on a book called Beautiful Disaster. I know not so much about this movie or book. I know that it was a book that I read when I was a teenager and simply moved moved on. I really don't have any recollection of the context or the lore surrounding this book. Unlike the, you know, book series movie adaptation like after where there's a lot of lore and there's a lot of lore around the author and the context and the concepts of the plot. This one, I don't know. There might be a very big history on this book that I don't know, but all I know is that it comes with Beautiful Disaster. And then there's a second book called Walking Disaster, which is the boy's point of view, because the first book is the girl's point of view. And then there is a third book, which is a novella called Beautiful Wedding, which there's also a movie based on that. And before we get started, I want to let you guys know that there's a merch sale going on my merch site right now. So if you were interested in buying merch, but it was a little bit too expensive, there's actually a discount going on right now for the end of summer. So make sure you guys check that out and you can rep some Trin level merch this fall. Want to know how I stay smelling good? With Scentbird, you can explore your scent profile without breaking your bank. All Scentbird scents come in this case. You have a 0.27 ounce vial of perfume. This is more than enough to see if you really like how it like, smells on your skin. And it comes in this case, so you can just snap it on. You put one side on, you put the other, and then you snap it to lock it. So this is perfect for when you're traveling abroad or if you're just needing a perfume to throw in your bag, this way it's not going to leak everywhere in any type of traveling situation. Scentbird sent me a couple of scents. They sent me Commodities Milk, which is one of my all time favorite scents that I was so excited to have a long trial for because I've only had a mini vial that I used up super quickly. So with Scentbird, I was able to try it for like more than a month uh, because it's also a stronger scent. So I don't even have to use that much and I just absolutely absolutely die for it like definitely gonna be my like winter scent it is so warm it is so cozy sweet it is everything that I need from a winter fragrance and they also sent me Juliet has a gun not a perfume which if you know anything about perfume if you like uh, perfume brands this perfume is like a staple it just smells so it girl like it's it girl vibes if you know what i mean you know what i mean i also got cherry bomb from confessions of a rebel this has been a really nice scent to try this summer because it's fruity but it still has an essence of something a little bit warmer so something like of an essence of like a cherry pie rather than just like a fresh basket of cherries or like a maraschino cherry it's a little bit warmer and it's got a little bit like of a a uh, sweeter base to it, which I like, especially from fruit scents. I usually don't like something that's super florally fruity. I like something that's a little bit warmer um, and uh, 
sweeter and a little bit more vanilla based. Scentbird offers a vast range of different fragrances from high prestigious brands that you know of and you've always wanted to try or smaller brands that you might not have heard of but give a chance and it might become your new favorite scent. Each fragrance comes with a 30 day supplies meaning you get to have the full experience of trying out the scent. Scentbird is the best way to expand your perfume knowledge and experience with different scents while minimizing the risk of buying a bunch of stuff that you're not gonna finish. And if you're interested in trying Scentbird, you can use my code TRIN55 OFF the link at the top of the description for 55% off your order today. That makes your first scent from Scentbird just $8. That's half the price of the normal. Thank you Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. It's Duno! It's Duno! Yay! It's Duno! Yay! Are you good girl? And as always, Juno's joined with me today because she likes being in every single one of my videos now. Thank you, Juno. She's putting in hard work. This is two back-to-back -back filming days for her. Exhausting. Exhausting. It's very hard work for her. I've always wanted to go to college. And I've just been accepted second semester. I think this is like so weird because like later on in the movie, it's like a very big stink about how she can't gamble and how she's underage and she can't do it. When it's like the whole idea of her being a poker prodigy was not that she was like so good at poker, was that, that she was his lucky charm. So she was just there around the gambling underage and that was okay. I don't know how poker rings necessarily work, but I find that like, a little girl just sitting around the poker table even if she's not playing is a little weird. I want to live a normal life with kids my age. I'll call you when I'm ready to talk. So the idea is she runs away from home, she leaves her poker prodigy life, she leaves her queen's gambit past life and wants to live a normal life going to college. Oh hey, oh by the way, we don't talk about the circle, it's a secret. What's a secret? Exactly. And this also pisses me off because like she has been around this type of lifestyle her entire life and she's acting so like, oh my God, what is this? This is so scary. As if she wasn't around like illegal poker rings like through her entire life being a poker prodigy and her dad being like involved with like these types of people her whole entire life. Whatever. This isn't for me. I'm gonna go back to the dorm and study. Man. I find it so weird that not only did she bump into someone, she had to be like, hi. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what are we doing? I get it. The, the meat cute of it all, running into someone. But I would never run into someone and then caress their chest. Not even on my worst days would I do that. <laughs> And maybe I'm just like not really in tune with underground fighting rings, but I just like don't picture the people duking it out in a match to be like two of Troy Sivan's background dancers in the Rush video. Like I figure them to be more muscular, more beefy, more rugged looking, a little bit even like dirty looking. Like these two are feeling the rush. They're not fighting underground boxing matches. Like that's not what's happening. Like he doesn't look like he fights. I'm sorry he doesn't. Like the whole idea that Dylan Sprouse is his character like just doesn't necessarily work. And I'm solely basing this right now off of just his look. We haven't even gotten like more than two lines out of him. I'm not gonna like like drill into like that whole part of it. Giving him a buzz cut and putting like a bunch of like tattoos on him is not really giving him that rugged look that I picture for someone that competes in underground fighting rings. I just think he looks so clean cut and this is like supposed to be his introduction that he is this intimidating bad boy fighter that she's having like, oh my God, he's so attractive. And he looks like, so clean cut and like 
he looks like his character in After where he was like a literal nerd. Like he doesn't look different and he's not exuding any aura that is like intimidating cage fighting ring guy. She's looking at his Instagram and from our knowledge of what we just saw of the events last night, the first thing that she gets told is the classic line of like, the first rule of Fight Club, we don't talk about Fight Club. And, but he's posting it on his like IG, his public IG, cause I'm assuming she didn't like request him to follow him. Like, I feel like she would be like way too embarrassed to do that. So it's obviously a public Instagram account and he's posting about the Fight Club that's apparently not supposed to be talked about. So, What's the truth? Is it Fight Club or is it just a hobby that everyone can know about apparently? Okay, I'm not sleeping with you. I'm not trying to sleep with you or bag you. I'm the equivalent of the girl behind them right now. Like, leave me alone. You're not going to let this go, are you? I'll pick you up at eight. What a lazy way to write, first of all. Her being like, leave me alone. And he's like, just staring at her. Like, he's not even like saying anything. And she's like, why don't you just leave me alone, you freak? It's like, why don't you stop talking to him? And I like don't like blaming women in those scenarios. Like, yes, he is staring at her, but like, if I was in class, I don't think I would be arguing with a guy behind me if I wasn't interested with in, like, if I wasn't interested, I wouldn't talk. I'd be like, I'm in class right now. You chose to end that sequence with him just staring at her and her being like, leave me alone. And then him being like, I'll pick you up at eight. It's like, you're just begging me to do all the work and be like, yes, this is believable. It's not. Oh, oh no. You're so cute and you're crying. I'm swear. not, I'm not crying. It's and Parker's like 35 years old. He's like, much older than her. Like you can't just put a backpack on him and like expect me to believe that he's in college or the same, it, it, I can believe anyone's in college. There's adults in college all the time. You guys never let me forget that. But the idea that like, there's gonna be a romantic fling between them and she's freshly like 18. He literally looks like he's been drinking for 10 years. Like stop. Hey, Charlie that Travis will be okay. Oh, he won't care. He likes you. We're gonna have a sleepover. So much fun. We'll make s'mores. As she leaves. We're gonna have a sleepover. It's gonna be so fun. Actually, I'm leaving. Awesome. <laughs> Why would you even open the door to a house that it's not yours? Like the audacity to be like, oh my God, when it's like literally not your house. Like you're a nosy motherfucker. Consent date. Never be too careful nowadays. How many women do you have? First of all, I can't even remember if this is like an original idea from the book. Even if it is to solidify the fact that Travis, this is like fuck boy. I am all for solidifying that like this guy that they're gonna be like enemy lovers and making it so like he's horrible. But like this whole thing of like, I have this app where people uh, have contract because you can't be too careful nowadays is just, First of all, I think it's a shitty way to show that a character is like a fuckboy or so whatever. Like we already have like major context clues that he is a whore and that's wonderful. We just saw him having sex with a girl. We just saw him throw away the number. We get it. We don't need this like additional layer to it that he also has this app where he makes people sign contracts because you can never be too sure. It's over explaining something that's already implied and on top of that it's an over explanation with something that's not even funny and doesn't lead to an interesting conversation at all no one but me sleeps in my bed well then why would i be allowed in your bed are you planning on having sex with me tonight no and it's settled like why did she even eat it i would never ever if i just found out that some guy was like banging in the next room and then like she put food in my mouth, I would not eat it. Make yourself at home. Sorry, I just have a big 10 a.m. bio test to cram for, but I can be back to the kitchen. Nah, you're fine. This is just, it's kind of just saying whatever is fine. What I don't like about this, okay, I don't like a lot of things about it, but I don't like it that they have this like banter scene that's seemingly something that's like an argument of like very different opinions on things. She thinks he's gross, misogynistic, and then he's like, you're sleeping in my bed tonight. And she's like, no, I'm not. And like, so adamant on that fact. And then is in it the next second. Like she makes a whole big fuss about like, I'm not doing that. I don't like you. I don't like you at all. 
And then she's like in his bed the next second, like all her notes in it being like, yeah, I'm like making myself comfy as fuck. Like I deserve to be here. It's like, why wouldn't you do that on the couch? And enemies to lovers, the whole point is that like, they are complete opposites and then find some sort of common ground of like, I hate you so much that I love you. It's like this like pull that you can't ignore. But to me, it seems like in this, it's not really this like battle within her to hate him. It's just kind of like something that she like, has when they're talking to each other and then kind of throws out the door the next second that they're together. Like, it's like, oh my God, I can't stay here. Travis is here. And then she sees him and she's like, you're disgusting. And then she like goes into his bed the next second. Wow, that's a lot. It's practicing safe sex a crime. <laughs> why, she, why are you touching it? Why are you touching it? Um, Is this a yo-yo? No. Definitely not. I would never in a million years touch. It's still on the bed. It's still in the bed and it is vibrating. I'm sorry. I would never, ever, if I was in a man's bedroom and I saw that there were intimate toys used in the bedroom, I, oh, I would never in a million years touch it. I, actually never. Like, the fact that she touches it and is like, what's this? Like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what these, these toys are. Like, what is that? It's like, first of all, you're pissing me off because you're acting like you don't know what that is when they're surrounded by a bunch of fucking condoms. And second of all, you're touching it with your bare hands as if that's not the most disgusting thing ever. Even if for the, for the slightest chance that this motherfucker that's deemed as the most disgusting man on earth washes them. He could have put it up his butt or something. It could have been his stuff. Fucking a dookie on it. Like it literally could have had like poo poo caca dookie on there. And you're like, let me just like, no, no let me, let me go touching that stuff. Cause you're stupid. Girl. I actually love that scene and, and not for the fact that I want to see Dylan's process, but the, I love that scene because I love the idea that like even the straightest woman ever would not deem like the male buttocks as something that you are aroused by. Like even the straightest woman ever would never look at a man butt and be like, <laughs> like it's a man butt it looks funny and that's okay and I and you know I respect male butts and I respect what they do for society and like I'm not gonna shame anyone like it is your body it is what it is but I think it's just funny that like this scene is like to depict some sexual attraction and curiosity and it's like his butt <laughs> whatever whatever like, sure, I don't even want to continue watching this scene. Like, I hate this. So. I am i can't even show that because it's like rated R. I can't show it, but I'll describe it. She's essentially, you see where her hand is. It's over his nether regions and he is having some morning wood, as some would say. And she's touching it in her sleep thinking that it's a kitty. She's having a dream about a kitty and she's like smiling and giggling in her sleep and she's touching his penis, his aroused member, if you will. I'm saying this because I'm not gonna like show it. Like it's like literally rated R. I don't want my channel to be taken down. And I don't understand the, the concept behind it that like anybody in their sleep would do that. Especially if you're sleeping with someone that you don't necessarily know. But let me just use myself for an example. I'm very aware when I'm sleeping next to people that I'm not super comfortable with or not super familiar with. Like even when I'm sleeping like next to my girlfriends when we're on a trip, it's not that I'm like uncomfortable by them, but I know that we don't sleep together every night, so I'm gonna be a little bit more aware of my surroundings and what I'm necessarily doing at night to make sure that they have their allotted space. But if I was sleeping next to this guy that I just have like prefaced by saying how much I hate him, I think I would be really aware if I was touching them and touching a penis. I feel like most people would be aware if they were touching a penis. You. I didn't do anything. You touched me. Oh, says the man with the raging hard on. You should be locked up. Oh my god. So 
such an infuriating scene. And you know what? I can, I can imagine where she's coming from, right? If I woke up and suddenly my hand was on someone's penis, I'd probably be a little scared too. I'd probably be like, oh my God, this man literally put my hand on his penis. Like that would literally scare the shit out of me. Since we know the context of it, it's easy to be like, why is she mad at him? But I guess if I woke up and I like randomly felt like my hand was on someone's penis, I probably wouldn't assume that I w like willingly did that in my sleep. I would be pretty upset if someone grabbed me in my sleep. Like if I was him, I'd probably be pretty upset that someone touched me. Very conflicting. But the whole scenario just really bothers me and I don't like it that it was included. You don't respond to any of my texts and now you're here dressed like that with your titties hanging out. Titties hanging out? Why would you say that to anyone? Like, and they're not even hanging out. Like the idea, like he's saying titties hanging out as if she's not wearing like the most like conservative dress ever. Like she has her little bit of cleavage, but like arms are covered. Like she could go to a wedding in that dress. She's not turning heads like for being inappropriate. Like, if you're gonna make him say that line of titties hanging out, like, make them hang out. I must break you. Go for it. Yes. That guy could kill you. No, he couldn't. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, that guy looks like a Twitch streamer. Like, he looks exactly like the last person that he fought. Like, it's not that big of a difference. If he manages to lay a hand on me, I'll go without sex for a week. Three months. Three months? That's impossible for someone like you. That's impossible for someone like you. I am never having sex with you. I don't want to have sex with you, Paige. I want to be around you. You're good for me. What? What? I don't want to have sex with you, bitch. I want to be around you. You're good for me. What? What am I watching? You're like... You're pulling my leg at this point. Like you're actually like making me have like whiplash while watching this because first of all, her even agreeing to this bet is ridiculous. What, there's no, there's nothing in it for her. Nothing in it for her. What do I gain out of you not having sex for three months? I gain nothing. I gain absolutely nothing from you not having sex for three months. Absolutely nothing. And then if you win, I have to stay with you. What? Both are a punishment for me because I don't get anything. If you're, unless you're gonna give me money or something, like why would I care if you don't have sex for three months? And then the next part of the scene where it's like, I'm not having sex with you. I don't wanna have sex with you, bitch. You're good for me. I wanna be around you. Like, what the fuck is that? Like, what do you want from me? Because honestly, Calling me a bitch and saying, I don't want to have sex with you, bitch. Kind of sounds like you hate me. And then saying, I want to be around you. You're good for me. I think what this movie does wrong is that they think that enemies to lovers is this constant back and forth of loving versus hating. Like, and even within the same sentence, I don't wanna have sex with you, bitch, you're good for me. Like immediately insulting someone and calling them something derogatory and then saying that you wanna be around them and that they're good for them. Like that is not what enemies to lovers really is in a grand scheme of things. Like even for something like as simple as, let's just like use for example, like Ron and Hermione, like they have this distaste for each other. They have this banter and it goes on for years, but they're not in this constant back and forth of like, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you. They're kind of at this like, odds with each other where they're like oh like you're so fucking annoying throughout like so many different movies and then they finally have this like attraction towards each other and i think that it's like completely misinterpreting the idea of what enemies to lovers really is and the appeal of it right the uh, the appeal is what matters right we can all have interpretations of enemies to lovers and why like it's so popular but there's a certain appeal that you have to adjust for because people don't like it for the sole fact of someone not liking each other and then getting together. It's a certain pattern that is why it works. A certain level of pining after each other and like unspoken pining that is like very integral to the trope of enemies to lovers and why people like it. Pack your bags, pigeon. You're coming home with me. Like I could say so much about that scene of him like doing 
the monkey thing. <laughs> and like, uh, pack your bags, pigeon, you're coming home with me. Pack your bags, pigeon, you're coming home with me. Like I could say a lot, but do I want to? He does not seem like a crazy person. I don't need him to be, right? I don't need him to be. But in this role where they're telling him to do these things, it kind of just reminds me of like some annoying class clown in like high school. And that's no offense to Dylan Sprouse. I don't, th I'm not a Dylan Sprouse hater. I don't think that like, he's got it for this role. I mean, and, and and that's really saying a lot and very much giving a lot of props to the role itself. Do I think anyone would really have the chops to take on this role and really transform the film? No, because the source material and what they're given is not all that great. I'm picking at it. I'm picking at Dylan Sprouse because it is such an eccentric character that is kind of shoved in my face constantly. And... I just don't think he was the right pick. Would anyone have been? The world will never know. But from what they gave me, I can confidently say that his performance in this just like wasn't it. He used to be a high stakes poker player named Abernathy. That's so funny because his name is Abernathy in The Walking Dead. This is you in the article, isn't it? Lucky 13 in the house, lucky 13. Since I've already seen the movie, as we know, because I've already recorded this video one time, this scene is so pointless. Other than the fact that it reveals to Travis that she's a poker prodigy, it actually reveals nothing later on. And it's a very big misdirect and not even a purposeful misdirect, just a lazy like way to make the scene seem more dramatic than it is. Cause the guy, the oldest brother, brings out the article and it's like, that's you, isn't it? And it's like a big reveal and it's, you've got some like pensive, suspicious sound effect going on in the background of like this reveal. It's very like serious and nothing happens. Like this scene doesn't matter later on. Like Travis has no further questions about her being a poker prodigy or about her dad. He doesn't like, he doesn't push on it any further. It, is a pointless scene and I don't know why they include it other than like her meeting his family and her hustling them. It literally is a pointless scene other than the fact that it like reveals to Travis that she's a poker prodigy. Oh, you are a snorter. Mm. I didn't I'm not ticklish. Whoa, okay, don't. Your don't. Uncle's you really want to play this? Okay. I thought his towel was going to fall down and I thought it was going to be like a whole debacle of that sore of like, oh my. But like his towel didn't fall down and she bites his nipple or something. Like great misdirect. Like I, you, 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 I thought you got me with the towel falling down and it didn't. And then she bites his peck. Very... Very cool misdirect. And then they end up kissing after she bites his boob. Travis, you're vulgar, you're a brute, you're... It don't feel the same, feel the same. See, it's like these scenes would have been more impactful if she didn't act like this throughout the entire movie. Like it would have been more impactful when she's having this dilemma if she wasn't acting like that throughout the, the entire movie. You're horrible, you're disgusting, you're awful, you're brute, you're vulgar, I hate you. Mm, I'm gonna sleep in your bed and like be cheeky with you and basically go on dates with you and go to your family's house. And I don't like you, you're gross. But like, let me kiss you. Like, it's not a switch. It's not a surprise if it's something that she's been doing throughout the entire movie. And that's, again, another big part of Enemies to Lovers is the kiss that we all know that's gonna happen, but it's at a unexpected point in the movie. I just, ugh. I like how it shows her past message as if laptops do that. As if laptops just show your past message that you sent as well. They don't do that. You would not be able to see the past conversation. Shouldn't you be worried about your boyfriend or something? My boyfriend? Yeah, Mick. Mick is my dad. Travis, you invaded my privacy and then you turned around and ghosted me? Abby, wait, wait. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was jealous, I messed up. That whole scene, I have so much to say about it. I have so much to say about it because first of all, involving a miscommunication trope and it's not even a miscommunication because she immediately clears it up. He spends one night drinking, being sad about it and like 
is cleared up the next morning. Not miscommunication at all. Miscommunication would be her not wanting to admit that she has an estranged relationship with her father and just kind of eating it and saying like, I'm sorry you had to see that. Like I would have loved that if she just like did not say that it was her dad and kind of just was stubborn and didn't want to admit that she has a bad relationship with her father and she doesn't want to admit the type of person that her dad is. I would have loved that. I would have loved it if it was like an actual miscommunication between them and that she realizes that she found out that her dad's trying to get into contact with her and she doesn't want to admit that her dad's trying to get into contact with her for whatever reason that she has shame around her relationship with her dad. For her to just be like, yeah, that was my dad. It just like is why is that even included in this dynamic between them? Like it's why is this a rift between them when it's not really a rift at all? I wish they had like a scene between them, which they don't because I've obviously already watched the movie. They don't. I wish they had a scene between them where he's kind of like, you're just getting mad at me because you don't want to admit that you like me. Like, because that's the whole point, right? Is that she's getting ridiculously over the top mad about these things to have a reason not to like him. And I wish that was like a point that was proven within the movie is that like, you're not actually mad about this stuff. This stuff is really not that big of a deal. If you're gonna follow a trope, gosh, make it a good trope, like make it uh, like follow the trope correctly. There's a formula built for you when it revolves around tropes like this. Romantic tropes are like the easiest to follow. They're the easiest to pull off and you're still somehow messing it up. I don't understand. There he is. I should probably go talk to Travis. Yeah. Hey. You even recruited Parker. Well, he found you. Yeah. Should have known that you guys would be hanging out. <laughs> well, I can trust him. See, I don't understand it because she like goes up to him, willingly talks to him. And then she's like, well, I can trust Parker as if like, and I don't know the dynamic that they have because she seems to be so angry about him invading her privacy, but then willingly went up to him and was like, hey, I, I don't understand either characters, but she really does bother me because I would have so much more respect for her if she just hated him constantly throughout the movie. But her back and forth really does irk me. Don't piss me off. Uh, I'm already pissed off. This is the second time I've had to watch this stupid movie. And now you're pissing me off even more because you're weird. You heard of alcohol poisoning? You hit double digits an hour ago. What are you counting? Nothing more than I hate than drunk girl gets told by man that she should stop drinking. I hate drunk acting in TV shows and movies. Unless it's blame it on the alcohol episode of Glee where they're all drinking for the first time. Unless it's that. I love that. But this, I don't like girl acting drunk and guy being like, you, dude, you're cut off. It's like, shut up. You're gonna have to walk away from me because I can't walk away from you. <laughs> Beautiful. That's literally so gross. Like if someone did that to me, I don't think I could look at them the same because I, uh, what would probably happen is that they throw up on me, I would probably throw up on them. That's actually so foul and kind of funny. I do appreciate a funny scene of a throw up scene. Again, blame it on the alcohol episode of Glee season two. Like it's on the same level of the gray vomit. A foot massage. Just ridiculous. Mind you, she was just like hating him last night and like nothing's changed. They didn't have a conversation that she can remember about like reconciling their relationship. She was so mad about it last night. And now it's like all of that is forgotten because she wants a foot massage and now he's gonna give her a foot massage and it's gonna be sexy, which foot massages are not sexy. I like literally am so sick and tired of the media trying to push that like foot massages and anything to do with foot is like romantic in movies. I'm sick of the media trying to push that. I'm sick of the media trying to convince me that like foot massages are something that I, I need to find as like this romantic thing. It's not gonna be, and it's never gonna be. It's never gonna be. What about him? He's placing bad bets and owns my boss. They're gonna break his legs if you don't come with me. Just a complete tonal shift of the movie. Your dad's legs are gonna be broken if you don't come with me. Like literally not at all like a tone that's been set throughout the entire movie. Like at least I can appreciate with like after and even like Fifty Shades of Grey when those serious plot lines are put in, I can honestly 
I can appreciate them for the sole fact is that they kind of set up the movie to be like that from the very start. It's seen as a drama. Like Fifty Shades of Grey is considered like a drama thriller romance. And I can appreciate that when they do like like thread in these more serious topics that are not just about their relationship. And after is the same way, but this is like deemed as a romantic comedy. And then it's a very serious plot line of her dad being involved in like gambling and, and debt paying. Look Angel, you look nice, but this is a high stakes room. Do yourself a favor and go to the main floor and pick out a shiny slot machine. And I do think that this would have been a very much more interesting movie if this was a more integral to like the main plots of the movie of their relationship. I, th I think it would have been interesting if like she had to do this throughout this entire time and this was like this big secret that she was keeping that she kept having to play poker to win money to be able to afford college. I think making that a more integral part of the story makes this seem more realistic to the plot line. I had to track you down to a strip club in Vegas. One day you're dressed like a nun, then you're wearing this. Who the hell are you? God, I love you. I hate this. I absolutely hate this idea that he's like actually mad or that they're actually even having this argument. Like it's pointless because it's, another attempt at it being this betrayal of trust and him being like, I don't even know who you are. When first of all, hey, where are you going? Where are you going? You don't wanna stay? You mean? Sit. Good girl. It's like an attempt at giving them some an actual con conflict and it's not because he's known that she had she was a poker prodigy he he knew all of this the only way that he can say that it was like a kept secret is if she never told him but you added an entire scene of him figuring out that she was a poker prodigy and had an estranged relationship with her father you added that whole plot line in just for him to show up and then them have an argument about how First of all, she was like, I had it handled and now she's mad at him for no reason. There's literally no reason for her to be mad at him. And then second of all, him being like, I don't even know who you are. Like, what the fuck? It's like, you guys can't keep pretending that you guys don't know who each other are because you guys virtually have no secrets with each other. You guys like tell each other everything. You love me? You don't know me. It's not true whatever you're going through. You don't know me as if like she hasn't like told him the truth the entire time. And Travis, you make me crazy. Shit. Again, and she does this same thing that she's done this entire time. I hate you, you make me crazy. Come over here and let me make out with you. It's like, okay. And this is what it is. Like, I I get what they're trying to do. I get what they're trying to do. It's supposed to be like a comically comedic scene of them like not being able to have sex. First of all, very odd that they're choosing to do this after a very intimate scene they have. I get it. I get what the goal is. It's supposed to be this like really messy chaotic scene that just like doesn't work out. It's supposed to be almost like a cartoon, but it doesn't work when that's like that dynamic hasn't like worked the entire movie so this whole big funny scene doesn't really work and it's this idea that like they're trying to do everything at once and they can't pick a tone of what they want to do if you're gonna have them have this big fight before this of him saving her and then her being like you make me crazy i don't want to be around crazy my entire life and then have this outlandish crazy scene it doesn't work it doesn't work at all oh she totally bought it Hand it over the chips, no problem. So what do you think she's gonna, you know? <gasps> See, but I have no idea where you are. I'm in college. Oh my God, I'm gagged. I'm gonna need you to give me these chips. Get out of the club, get out of town. Okay, we'll figure it out. I love the recap of this as if we like didn't just see it. You should shoot them. Ow! Get out! Out of my life, get out! 
Dude, I wish she had a gun and I wish she, she shot him. I wish, I wish, I wish she did. That's fucked up. I literally was not expecting that. What a good twist. I love that. And now he's fighting for no reason. I'm sick. I can't believe he's been in jeans in every single one of these fights. Like, not even like the like big fight did he put on something else. Like, it's always a pair of like slim straight jeans. Damn. The way he has no marks on him is crazy. After being whipped with a chain and he doesn't have any marks on him. Guys. Oh my god, I do remember that. I totally remember the fire. But I feel like that happened in like an earlier fight. I feel like a fight happened earlier in the book and then he, they had to like get out. Maybe I'm mistaken. I don't really remember the book at all. She was about, the way she was about to leave the other guy, whatever his name is, like the way she was like, let's go, let's leave without him. Hey Travis. Why do you call me Pigeon? It's a dove. An attractive girl. Uh, a winning hand in poker. See? You're my Pigeon. The way she never asked what Pigeon meant throughout the entire like movie is like beside me because I would have asked that immediately if someone started calling you a, a Pigeon. That'll be a disaster. Let's do it. What happened to school? What happened going to classes? What happened to all of that? <laughs> I, that is actually so funny. That's the funniest thing ever is that they like already got confirmed for the second movie. Like they were already like set to do the second movie when they were making the first movie. They're like, we invite you to the next one. We're getting married. Woo! I actually love that. That's actually so funny. Cause it's like, of course they would. Of course they would. This movie is a movie and it is what it is and it is what it isn't. I think that the people who like this movie, I applaud you and I think you're great. I think that I personally wouldn't watch it again. I'm just not at that age where I really enjoy stuff like this anymore and I think I'm okay with that. But in the same sense, I'm like, who the fuck else is it made for? Because this is a rated R movie. So it's made for an adult consumer of at least 18 years of age but it's not made for a 22 year old, which is only four years older. Girl, who the fuck is it for then? If you're opening the windows and you're in the kitchen, who's driving the bus? That's what I wanna know. And one last thank you to today's sponsor, Scentbird. Thank you, Scentbird, for sponsoring today's video. Make sure you guys use my code, TRIN55OFF, or use a link in my description to get 55% off your order at Scentbird. And that wraps it up for today, guys. I know this was a little bit of a spliced and cut together uh, video, being that I did have some past footage that I wanted to use for the end of this video. I would love to know what you guys think of Beautiful Disaster. If you guys go subscribe to my Patreon, you guys can see the extended version of this. Make sure you guys don't forget to subscribe so you can see more videos from me and turn on the notifications bell as well so you guys can be notified every single time I post a video and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it because it helps out my content a lot and helps my videos be pushed out to more people and overall just lets me know that you guys actually like the videos that I'm making so I can continue to make them for you guys and don't forget that there is a merch sale on my site right now so make sure you guys go pick up some discounted merch because this is the end of the summer sale and I want you guys to look cute in the fall thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in my next video